Okay, so let's get moving here. So welcome everybody. Good morning. Uh, today you have done marching with us, then leads the Applied Numerical Algorithms Group. And he'll talk about who told us how to use adaptive measure fragment, AMR for short, uh, in the modeling of uh, Antarctic ice. Before then it starts, um, I would encourage you, for those who have not done so yet, 15 of you have done it. Sign up for the poster session on August the 6th. Okay. Yes. Okay. And if you need more information, if you miss the link to the registration page, tell me. Okay. <laughs> So the first question I was to answer is, um, why I'm wearing a mask? Um, I should let everyone know that I, just in case you're interested, I tested positive for COVID last week. Um, I had symptoms for a couple of days. I've been symptom free since Saturday, and but the protocol is I should still wear a mask for the rest of the week. So if any of you want to run screaming from the room, now's your chance. Um, you probably, probably turn in your thing, so you're good. Um, it was my father's day present from a troop of Boy Scouts. So, um, so first, a little bit about who I am. Um, I grew up outside of Philadelphia and Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, and then went to high school in Orlando. And I came out here for grad school. Um, I did my undergrad at my, in the University of Florida. All my degrees are mechanical engineering. Uh, I did my PhD down the hill at UC Berkeley, and then I came to LVL as a postdoc and never left. So I came here for grad school and never left, because it's, I mean, why would you leave? Um, and in that time, I, I have some, I'm now the, the group lead for the Applied Numerical Algorithms Group in, in what is what used to be CRD is now HPC or H, HP. No, it's AMCR. Um, and over that year, I basically spent my time developing algorithms for, for solving systems of PDEs, uh, partial differential equations, um, in a bunch of different fields, uh, everything from fusion to ice sheets and everything in between. So um, I'm married. We have two boys who are now 17 to 14. The 14 year old is the one who gave me COVID. Um, <laughs> What I do when I'm not right, when I'm out here is I, I bike. Um, I bike to work every day, which is kind of fun. Uh, I spent this, uh, this spring coach, helping coach the Berkeley High, High School mountain bike team, which was also a lot of fun. So we got, there's a, lot of, there's a whole bunch of trails up there that are really awesome. Um, music, travel. I broke my sternum a couple of years, like a year and a half ago in a silly mind, mind crash. That's my claim to fame. Uh, found out you can break a sternum. Uh, so this story, begins back in 2002, which is actually before most of you were born, I think, at this point. Um, starting to come starting to come to terms with that fact. Um, and it's 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 an, a particular ice shelf in the Weddell, in, in the Antarctic Peninsula near the Weddell Sea. So this is Antarctica, and this is where it is, the Antarctic Peninsula, that part that sticks out toward um, South America. And there's these ice shelves. Ice shelves are basically floating, like where they have shelves of ice. Um, and basically what happens is the ice, this is a satellite picture, um, the ice is flying from left to right, flying from the land into the sea, and this is a place where it's basically just a big floating mass of ice. And basically, there's a series of satellite pictures that, 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 that caught this happening. Otherwise, no one would have known what happened. Um, you can see even at, even even at this first shot back in on this is midsummer, by the way, in Antarctica. Don't forget that it's it's um, the seasons are reversed there. Um, so you can see all these, all these black things are basically um, melt water. So the ice, there's a bunch of it's it's a warm summer. The ice is melt, the ice is melting. You have these ponds of water flo um, forming on the surface of the ice shelf. And over the next um, couple weeks, you can see that the um, the ice shelf collapsed. It basically just completely disintegrated. And so you know, in a span of months, you went from from having a complete thing to basically nothing. And this caught everyone by surprise because everyone thought that this was that I shot, the ice sheets were pretty stable, right? Everything moves at glacial paces, right? Um, and so ice glacial was sort of this backwater in science where people just went out and hung on the ice to, and measure things that were moving very slowly. Um, but in in that month, about 1,250 square miles of ice of ice shelf disintegrated, and this is likely due to what was then an exceptionally warm summer. Um, like I said, the melts pulls the surface basically um, results of surface melting and it turns out these, these milk pools basically are a bunch of warm, imagine a warm, dark spots on top of an ice shelf 
they're going to heat up and they basically act like big knives that cut through the ice shelf and basically shatter it. So that that they, they basically was the first we saw this this phenomenon known as hydrofracturing, where basically water basically will just basically dig its way, cut its way through the ice and chop it up. Um, it was also a time when there were exceptionally warm ocean temperatures in the surrounding ocean. Um, what kind of by surprise though was what happened in the aftermath. The glaciers that feed that ice shelf sped up and they they very rapidly went, they sped up about 300% on average. Um, and the mass level went from 2.2 2 .2 to 4 gigatons a year to about 22 to 40 gigatons a year. So it went up by a factor of 10. And this cut really everyone's right. Suddenly these things were, it was obvious that these things were much more dynamic than people expect. Everyone thought that, yeah, everyone knows ice shelves, you know, glaciers and ice sheets advance and retreat over, you know, ice sheet, you know, millennial time scales. But this is the first time anyone's seen something this dynamic happen in real time. And it's not the last. The Wilkins Ice Shelf did something very similar in 2008, 2009. So why do we care about that? There are currently two ice sheets on the planet. Um, the Greenland Ice Sheet has five to seven meters of sea level. Equipment. That means that if all the ice in Greenland melted, you'd have five to seven meters of sea level rise. The Antarctic Ice Sheet actually contains enough ice to raise sea levels by 57 meters. Um, now, no one expects that's going to happen, but there are oh, we'll more, more reasons why what we are worried about is there's 45 meters of sea level rise containing sort of the what are vulnerable sections of West Antarctica. Um, and Antarctica basically is divided into east and west sectors. Um, this is the this is the Western Hemisphere, this is West Antarctica, and this is East Antarctica. So when we talk about West Antarctica and East Antarctica, that's what we mean. Um, and why do we care? Basically, I don't need to go into this much. The sea levels are expanding. I mean, sorry, the sea levels are rising, and the sea level budget. About a third of that is due to basically the fact the oceans are expanding as they warm, right? So things warm up, they expand. Um, about a third of it is coming from the, the small glaciers and ice caps throughout the world. And about a third right now is coming from ice sheets, the Greenland and Antarctica. Um, and the, the issue is that if you look at the contributions, the contribution due to ice sheets has roughly doubled since 2000, will continue to increase. Um, glacier and ice caps, we're going to run out of those very soon. And so that, that won't be an issue. But the... Um, the, the big question is what happens with that 60 meters of ice of sea level rise in 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 in, in Arctic and Greenland, right? So the state of the art back in 2007 was that the IPC report back then basically called the ice sheet modeling and said this is not going to cut it. This, the, the models were very coarse, very they weren't able to they weren't able to match what we was already observing. And so DWE looked at that and said, well, we we can help with this. We have. Um, we have a lot of experience doing building models to model things that are, you know, like of all sorts of all sorts of uh, important physical phenomena, and we 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 have, we can help generate help put together this next generation of ice sheet models. So they the response was this sort of set of small funded projects, about six projects, and one of them was um, an LBL led AMR effort. Um, the big project was called Icicles for Ice Sheet Initiative for Climate. Uh, no, ice sheet or initiative, ice sheet initiative for climate in extreme scales. Um, and then the Berkeley effort, because it's Berkeley, was bicycles. Um, and then it turned out that folks in Bristol were doing the same thing at the same time. And so we decided to work together instead of instead of competing. And so it wound up being this collaborative effort between us and the UK. So how do ice sheets work? Um, basically, the way ice sheet work is basically imagine a place where it snows. And the, the soil is a melt and it just sort of piles up and piles up and piles up and piles up. And eventually at some point you get so much snow and it's, it's, it, that the, the bottom gets compressed and turns to ice. Um, and then at some point you, this continues on and at some point it starts to squeeze out on its own weight. So what's happening in this, in this sort of cartoon is that ice is piling up here in the, in the, in the cold center. And then it just starts because it's so, it's so heavy, it's just pushing and squeezing out to the sides. Like basically pushing toothpaste out of a tube. Um, and two things can happen. It can either end on land, like that's mostly what happens in Greenland. Or the interesting case for us is um, it can w wind up over the ocean. And when it extends out of the ocean, you, you form basically you transition from a grounded ice sheet to a floating ice shelf. This part here is the ice shelf. And the point where it transitions from grounded to floating is known as the grounding line. And we're going to use that term a lot because it, it, it's, it's sort of the key to everything. Um, and so what we care about, we want to model basically is how this, how this ice flows. Um, and it turns out that in Antarctica, what's happening is that it turns out these ice shelves push back on the grounded ice. So you have this river of ice flowing from left to right. Um, 
And for various reasons, ice shelf, maybe because it's got an island in the middle, maybe because it's got something on the side, it's pushing back on the on the ice that's that's flowing in it. And so it basically ice is is not it's it's not basically it's not flowing as fast as it could. If you weaken and, and thin this ice shelf, you lose that buttressing effect. And what happens then is the ice sheet, the ice, the ice, the upstream ice will speed up. And when the ice sheet speeds up, it thins, right? Because you imagine that you're, you're suddenly delivering more ice to the ocean, suddenly it thins. And that means the grounding line retreats. And there's a theory that says that if a grounding line is sitting on a, on a slope that is retrograde, that's where it deepens as you go inland, that's unstable. And so that means it's going to retreat uncontrollably until it gets to a place where it's stable. Um, so that's a bit of a concern because if you look at what at the, uh, the bedrock under an Arctic looks like, it turns out that this is, brown is above sea level and blue is below sea level. So there's a massive swath of Western Arctic that's actually sitting below sea level. The ice is actually sitting on that bedrock below sea level. And you can see also, you can see that it deepens as you head inland. So that's, that says uh, unstable, right? So if you look at cross section, this is a very carefully drawn cross section, um, basically uh, from basically this way. But you can see, sort of see how, the, how this looks. I mean, basically most of the land is actually below sea level and it deepens as you go inland. So that's suddenly a, a big concern. So we want to actually understand these things. So what does an ice sheet model look like in that case? So here's the ice sheet again, the cartoon, different, different cartoon, but it's sitting on the land. Snow falls up. Basically, what makes the ice sheet grow is snow falls on it, right? That makes it, makes it grow. Um, you have melting, either uh, melting from the surface in the lower regions or... Um, you have ocean circulation basically delivering heat under these ice shelves, right, which melts them from below. Ice either runs off as runoff and it's on land, or it, um, if it's an ice shelf, it'll break off and calve off. The, the term is calving for when ice sheets, when ice shelves break off. And then you have ice flow, basically from the mid, from the interior to the to the to the margins. And when you look to, if you wanted to write the equation for basically the rate of change of the ice thickness in any one place, it looks like this. Um, it's a very simple equation. Um, basically, the rate of thickness, DHDT is the rate of thickness change per time. Um, basically, sur the surface mass balance, the amount of snowfall on the surface is the source term. Um, based on melting, any place where the ice is melting, probably from below, it, it's a, it's a, it, moves, it reduces thickness. And then you have this flux divergence, which basically is it, it's the divergence of the ice flux. So if I'm standing in this place, you know, in the ice, and I've got ice flowing in from upstream and flowing out from downstream. If more ice is flowing in from upstream than is, than is flowing out downstream, the ice thickens, right? And I and I go up. If more ice is flowing out downstream than, than is coming upstream, then the ice thins and I go down. That's basically how that's what that term is. It's diverged as sort of a three-dimensional term of, of what that looks like. Um, and so we want to solve that. Um, and we want to use some physics to it. So ice is it's a very viscous fluid. Um, if, like I said, it flows, which is surprising if you ever looked at it, but um, it's a non, it's a non-Newtonian fluid in that it's, it, it's a shear thinning fluid, which means, which means as you, as you apply strain, as the um, ice begins to strain, it, the viscosity goes down. And that has some interesting Im Im implications on how it works. Basically, you tend to concentrate strain to very narrow, very shear bands. Um, and it's a very weird thing if you're used to thinking of like water, for example. Um, and there's different ways. It basically, it, it, it's a very low Reynolds number of fluids. So it basically solved, it basically it's represented by what's known as the, the Stokes approximation, which means the pressure forces the balance of viscous stresses. Um, if you actually solve the full Stokes system, it's the best fidelity to ice sheet dynamics, but it's also really computationally expensive. Um, you wind up solving this full three set of couple nonlinear element equations, and it winds up being very messy. And most people try, don't do that. Um, so what people try to do is try to approximate this. And that's actually pretty common in science. You want to you want to try to look at the mathematical structure of the equation you're solving and and use some kind of intuition to figure out what parts you can keep and what parts you can throw away. And one way to do that is use scaling arguments to to produce a simple set of equations. So you think of ice sheets, right? They're you can use the fact that they're thin. I mean, granted, they're they're kilometers thick, but they're hundreds of kilometers wide, and so they're dynamically very very thin layers, like almost like a membrane. And you can take that, that ratio of, of horizontal to vertical length scales, which will epsilon basically, um, and then propagate that through your set of equations and then start pulling out terms that are higher order than that. So if epsilon is small, epsilon squared is smaller, right? So you, if you keep only the terms that are order epsilon in those equations, you want it with a simpler set of equations, 
which are known as the bladder, the bladder patent system. And basically when I say their order is accurate to order epsilon squared, that means that I've thrown away everything that's epsilon squared or higher. Um, and this is a very common way of, a, of, a, of, a pro of approaching and solving these things, right? Um, it lets you use some intuition and not be sort of um, brute forcey about it. You try, to, you try to use some mathematics. And the one things we do at this lab is we, and in science, we try to be clever about how we solve things and not waste a lot of energy doing things that aren't necessary. Um, if we take this to an extreme, you can wind up with these very simple depth integrated things, which was what it was, people were doing back in the early 2000s. There are these very, very simple models, basically, which were order accurate to order epsilon. Um, they're easy to work with computation, which might be able to use them, but they're generally much less accurate and they miss major parts of the dynamics. So we don't want to do that. We want something that's ordered accurate to order epsilon squared. And what we actually do is something that's even cleverer. Um, we do something that's actually used the asymptotic structure of the full system to, to make a higher approximation. And the idea is you, um, in any place, any local place, you approximate, you can, you can start with the velocity of the bed and then sort of create a local approximation of the ice velocity. And then use that to basically compute the viscosities at all at anywhere in the column and then integrate that to the bed and then solve a two-dimensional two equation for just the velocity of the bed. Um, basically, it's only, it may not sound like much, but it lets you do a 2D problem instead of a 3D problem. And that winds up making things much simpler and easier to deal with. Um, so... That's a little bit of math, the you know the, the clever math that I wish I had thought of, but it was actually shown I Marshall with it. Um, and so the point is that we can now take a 3D system and make it a 2D system, which winds up being much easier to deal with. Um, so the question is, how do we actually solve systems of equations on the computer? Um, some of you may know this, some of you may not, because um, everyone has varying levels of, of background. So I'm going to just talk about this a little bit. Um, computers are really good at simple arithmetic, right? Like, Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Um, when I talk to elementary school kids, I like to say basically computers are really good at fourth grade math. Um, they just do it really well and really fast. But the equations in physics are, are usually continuous and complicated. For example, here's the heat conduction equation, right? It's a, it's a partial differential equation. Um, so what we do is we can't solve the continuous equations except for very, very, very um, special, specific cases. So we break the world up into small pieces, which we'll call cells. Whoops by laying down a combinational mesh on the domain. So we start with this continuous domain and we lay down this mesh and we solve basically a set of very simple arithmetic equations by approximating the, the, the actual equations, continuous equations on each cell. And you can, you can imagine that the, the cell spacing we'll call dx, delta x. Um, and you can imagine you can solve on like this coarse mesh or this fine mesh. Um, and one example is when you approximate derivatives, if you want to approximate df dx, um, basically, you can do this using um, finite differences uh, by basically just taking, you know, for example, this value minus this value over delta x. But then it turns out you can do this a couple of different ways, right? You can do a standard difference, a forward difference, or a backward difference. And each of them is actually better for different situations. So part of what we do is try to figure out exactly how to create a discrete, discrete vert set of equations that we want to solve on the computer. So we take this continuous system that's very hard to solve that we can't do in our heads, or on paper, and we create a discrete version of it that we can actually solve by solving a bunch of ar arithmetic equations. Um, and then, as you can imagine, the finer the mesh, the more accurate your simulation is. So, the solution on this, on this, can you see this? Can you even see this cursor? Or you can't, can you? The solution on this is much less accurate than the solution on this, right? You can imagine that, you know, like a camera with more resolution you get a better, better picture. Um, the problem is that with a finer mesh, that you have more things to solve for. And it goes up really fast. So in three dimensions, cutting using half the cell spacing means that the cost is 16 times as much for the same solution. Um, that's because you have, you know, two by two by two is eight, then actually you wind up taking smaller time steps as well. So, and it's also the case that often you need a really fine resolution in some places, but not others. And so what we do is this, this technique called adaptive mesh refinement, and it's actually something that was developed a lot. A lot of development for this actually happened in the Berkeley lab in various places. Um, and the basic idea is that you use local refinement of the combinational mesh to, to basically concentrate your, concentrate your combinational effort where, only where it's important. So for example, here you've got a very, very, a very coarse background mesh, but then you have these different sort of block structured areas where you 
increase the resolution to better resolve the thing. So imagine if you have like a vortex here or something like that, right? I mean, you will, you want to resolve that. Or if you're doing if you're doing the temperature on a table, yeah, you know, I probably want to resolve around where the this cold thing is. And then the adaptive the, the adaptive part of it means that we can dynamically focus it as we need it. So as things move, as solution changes, we can add a resolution and take it away, and these grids can move. Um, and a lot of goes a lot of effort goes into making that um, accurate and efficient. And it's you have to use special discretizations and and math to make sure you get it right. Um, so the bicycle ice sheet model is an adaptive measure of an ice sheet model. Um, and you can see, for example, here, this is the this is the Pine Island Glacier in Antarctica, which is comes which is basically located here. Um, the red line is the grounding line. You can see we've added a lot of really fine, refined mesh around the grounding line. So that we really need to refine the grounding line to like some kilometer resolution. Um, and it's uh gonna let's skip this thing going there. And so why do we care about this? Um it turns out the ice sheets have really localized regions where you need really high resolution, um, basically 500 meter resolution or better at the grounding lines. On the other hand, Antarctica is so big that you really can't resolve all of Antarctica at that level of resolution. So, and you don't necessarily know where the, where you need the resolution because as things evolve, as grounding lines move, you don't you need to know where they're going to go to keep the resolution going wherever it needs to be. Um, and so this really good problem is almost a poster child for adaptive measure plan for those reasons. Um, it's still a big problem. You still need to be able to run well on big machines, um, but it's a way of actually being able to resolve efficiently and effectively what we need to do. I mean, this is a plot of um, the ice velocity on Antarctica, where red is fast moving ice and blue is slow moving ice. And you can see one of the cool things about it is how it forms these rivers of ice, these networks of ice streams, which then be these big red ice shelves. The ice shelves, the big red things are the big ice shelves, and that they're floating, and that's why the ice is moving very fast. There's something, there's something to repeat it. There's no friction like against the bed. Um, so we're going to look at two different types of test problems. The first is we want to look at a very simple. There's a whole set of idealized problems you want to do to understand the basic dynamics, and they tend to look like sort of on the scale of a single ice stream, and they're you know very very regularized and very very idealized. But then we also want to do the full Antarctic. Right? We actually want to solve real problems. And this is so. This is fully Antarctica. This is resolved down to five meters. This is what our meshes look like, and you can see that it's, this is why AMR is so great. This is that we're only refining down to five. You can't, you can't even see where we're refining down to five meters. It's 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 only a very very small set. It's like one percent of the domain, but it's it's crucial to getting the dynamics right. Um, and the sort of the, the how we do this basically, we have a logical rectangular grid. We actually map have a vertical mapping in the, in the in the in the vertical direction. So we actually it's it's um our criticism is is Cartesian in, in x and y, and this map thing in the vertical direction. So it goes from zero to one depending on how thick the ice is. Um, we're solving like I said this two dimensional equation for ice thickness, which I've already talked about, and we have to solve this vertically integrated momentum balance. This bit, this this nonlinear system, which I'm only putting up here to basically say it's a big ugly nonlinear equation. Um, and that's what we spend, we literally spend 90% of our time solving that red equation, which is why it's red. Um, this is all built in the Chamble Adaptive Mesh Refinement Framework, which is developed here at Berkeley Lab. It basically designed, the idea is when you're doing adaptive mesh refinement algorithms, you wind up developing some very, very specialized things to handle things that course find interfaces and handle the regridding and all the things that go in, that are important for doing adaptive mesh refinement calculations. But there's a, anyone doing these things need them. So it makes sense to do these frameworks, AMRX, if you might have heard of also, there's another one which another framework which does this. It is you you get a lot of value from having developing these frameworks, which make basically make all, make all these toolkits, pieces of the algorithm, pieces that you can then you can then build on, and are common across a bunch of applications. Um, so then, once we have this model, what can we do with it? Um, the first thing we can do is we actually start coupling it with ocean ice, ocean earth ocean models and earth ice system models. Um, so the first thing we did was we um we coupled to an ocean model. Because remember, there's all this ocean forcing that we care about. Um, we couple bicycles to the uh, ocean circulation model pop, and you can imagine that makes popsicles. Um, and basically, the idea is that you have these models basically would uh, would evolve on their own, and then stop after like a some coupling interval, which is like a month, and then exchange the information. Like basically, the ocean model would give the ice sheet model its melt rates. And then the ice sheet model would trend, would give it back its the new under ice shelf geometry, like where the grounding line is, the ice thickness at any point, so you can tell where, so it can so it, you can reinitialize the ocean model to new geometry. Um, and we tried this for a very basic problem. Um, it's a, it's an ice in a 
it's the, it, the problem is known as MISO BIP. Um, it's MIP stands for Model Energy Comparison Project. Uh, I forget what MISO stands for. Um, and basically, it's ice flowing from left to right in this in this funny channel. Um, you can see that this is the ice. So it has the ground lines here, the ice shelf is here. And what happens is out here in the in the far field, you suddenly increase the the ocean temperature, and then that the ocean model transports that 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 warm water up in under the cavity and melts the ice, and then it evolves. It, it basically melts the ice sheet, the ice shelf, and the ice shelf then thins, and we lose a bunch of things and retreats. After hundred years, we turn off that warm water. Uh, it goes back to being cold, and then it should be covered. Um, so I'm going to show you a movie of what that looks like. This is the ice shelf going from left to right. The color I'm showing is the uh, melt rates. So um, blue is uh, this are all these orange stuff is placed in where the melt is high, um, and this black line is the grounding line. So you can see that um, it takes a few minutes, it takes a few years for the warmer to get there. But then we have this basically it lights up. And we can see we have this massive thinning happening at the grounding line and, it, and, and on the ice shelf in general. And it starts to retreat pretty dramatically. Um, within 25 years, you've really got a full-blown retreat going on. And you can see the ice shelf is, is thinning in weird ways. Um, it's actually, at this point, turning into a nice tongue because it's now no longer connected to the walls. Um, and it's just sort of, it's, it's really cool because it evolves. And the reason why it's not symmetric is the Coriolis force is actually pushing the warm water to one side. So that's there's a sort of a, a barrel um, circulation going underneath. This one we we basically convert, turn into a big long ice tongue, which is not very stable, so it breaks off, and then it's, you know so it continues to retreat. At this point, we've lost all the buttressing, and it's just basically just retreating like crazy. Um, and so we're sixty five or sixty seven years into it, um, and I just want to look a little bit because uh, this one we're just sort of in a steady state retreat, but that makes any sense. And it will retreat basically until it finds a stable place. Like I said, until it finds a place where the, where the, where the bedrock is tilted, is, is water is, where the bedrock is heading down as you head out, head out from, from the inland. So remember, after 100 years, we turn off the warm water forcing. Um, and so it takes a couple of years for the cold water to get in, under the ice. But then you can see that basically, the, um, at that point, the melting shuts down and it starts to recover. Um, it's much less exciting watching it recover. It recovers much more slowly. One of the one of the things we've learned about ice shelves and ice sheets in general is that they um they recover much more slowly than they than they retreat. So um, that's sort of a fact of life. Every experiment we've done is that recovery is a much slower process. Um, to the point where I'm not going to actually show you the recipe because it's, it just does this. Just imagine it going out a little farther. Um, another thing we can do is we can couple to the solid earth. So. It turns out that ice sitting on, on bedrock um, loads and unloads the earth, right? And so imagine if you have a bunch of ice sitting on bedrock and then you and then you take that weight off, the bedrock rebounds, right? It, it rises. And then if you put more ice on it, then it, then it pushes down on it. That effect is known as the as glacial ice static adjustment or GIA. And the way to think of it is that as we unload the ice, um, as, as we unload the bedrock, it, the bedrock starts to rebound. Um, and it turns out that's actually one of the things that's interesting is that people in, for example, Greenland, I mean, sorry, in Iceland, actually are seeing sea levels fall for them, partly because they're actually still rising, right? So their their actual island is is actually rising from the from the last ice age, and so they see, actually see sea levels going down. Um, but the idea is also the rebound can potentially stable help stabilize the ice sheet. So we want to understand what this effect impact means. And there's some, a lot of theory that a lot of suggestions that this will help. Um, but how this happens depends on the mountain properties. So, for example, you imagine if, if, the, if the bedrock is is sort of warmer and more and less viscous, it'll um, it'll rise faster. If it's colder and harder, it will rise slower. And it also depends on how fast the ice sheet changes. So we we did this. We coupled the bicycles bicycles to a solid earth bottle, and there's some evidence that the mantle under the West Antarctic ice sheet is actually hotter and weaker than elsewhere. So this actually might matter. And we looked at what happened for. Pine Island Glacier, which is the which is the, one of the one of the ice sheets, sorry, one of the ice streams in um in uh, the Amundsen Sea in Western Antarctica, and what we found was that including coupling with the with the with the Earth rebound can slow retreat and reduce the contribution of sea level rise, but it, the time still matters because um, it requires that retreat occurs at a similar time scale as the response. So imagine that if the retreat is too fast, by the time the the bedrock rebounds, the ice the grounding line is there's no more ice to to be able to rise, right? But 
So it means we have to make sure we get the time scales of all these things correct. Um, that means we have to be, our modeling has to be correct. Um, and this is just a, a movie showing how that happens. Um, it goes very slowly, actually. Um, so the, the, the one on the left, upper left, is, is the is the divine line retreat without the isostatic adjustment, and the one on the right is with GIA. Um, this is for Pine Island Glacier. Like I said, the, the flow is from top to bottom. Um, and the lower right is the actual uplift from, from this GIA. So you can see that as, as the Grand Line retreats, you get this actually pronounced like, you know, 30 to 50 meter uplift. uplift. The bedrock is actually rising there. Um, and you can see that actually they have different, at this point, the grinding line profiles are different. So you can see that it's actually retreating much more, somewhat more slowly with GIA than without GIA. Um, and the end is actually pretty noticeable after 100 and... 50 years or so. Um, so that's, but the end looks like that, right? So without GIA and with GIA, it's a pretty remarkable, remarkable difference. Um, and it winds up being about 17 millimeters of sea level rise, um, which may not sound like much. Remember that's 17 millimeters spread over the entire earth is actually a lot of water. Um, so it's actually meaningful. Um, and this is different with different uh, with different bedrock models. You get different answers, but it's still the the answer is still pretty consistent. Um, and we wrote a paper about this um, that came out in 2022. Um, but and it turns out there's always a but. Um, we went one of the things we were trying to figure out is that, so what exactly this means. So we actually what we did is actually went and looked at the total amount of water in the domain, right? So the, you you add up all the water that's in the ice and all the water that's in the in in the sea. And it turns out that what we missed was the impact of the rising seafloor. So fine, the ice sheets were trying to less, 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 less dramatically, but it turns out this rising seafloor actually squeezes out the ocean water, open ocean water, and puts it somewhere else, right? So it turns out the effect of that actually outweighs the reduced ice loss. So it's actually, at this point, the thing we actually, we actually thought was going to help us is actually making it worse. Um, so that was kind of a bummer. Um, that was one of the, the everything occasion is occasion there's signs there's moments of, of, of holy cow, and this is one of those holy cow moments. So sorry, that's not gonna save us. Um the other thing we, the other model we wanted to work with, look at another another um process we look at is what happens to water under the ice. So it turns out that meltwater under the ice can lubricate the bed of the ice, causing change in the basal friction, right? So you can imagine if you have water under the ice, if you have ice sitting on bedrock, it's going to have some friction against the bed. If you have water in there, it's going to lubricate it and it might go faster. And you see this all the time in, in Greenland because what it, you see in Greenland is Greenland's melting like a block of ice in the sun. You wind up with these big melt pools at the top on the surface and they melt water on top of ice is a bad situation. So it winds up throwing its way to the bed. These lakes drain very quickly and they wind up with flooding the underside of the ice with, with, with melt water. And you can actually see if you actually do put um, GPS sensors on the ice, you can see the, the ice accelerating and decelerating on a span of days. And um, as the ice sort of gets down there, it lubricates the bed and, it's, and makes it speed up. Um, but then we also have this weird transition where, um, so if you have a big film of ice, you can imagine that's a very effective lubricant, but it also, it means that the, um, the water is not very efficient at getting the water out of there. And so at some point during the melt season, you have more and more water getting in there and it, 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 it develops this efficient network of channels, which take the water from the inland and take it out. So at that point, once you have this channelized system, you're very efficient at moving the ice sheet, the water out from out from under the ice. But it also means you lose your lubrication and the ice slows down again. So you so with a span of the ice of of a melt season in Greenland, you see the ice speed up and slow down as this as this water system evolves, right? And so to really understand what's happening in the ice, we need to be able to understand what's happening with the water under the ice. And so we want to be able to model this. And it turns out the same thing. We don't know where, we don't know where these channels are going to form. Um, so it's another great idea for adaptive mesh refinement. And so we've built this um, subglacial hydrology model called SUMO, which basically is an AMR model which adapts the mesh as the channels evolve. So as, as this, um, basically you start with, 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 no, with, no, with no water, you start having these, these points towards the water where ice is making its way to the bed. And then it forms these channels, like you can see in this one, and you use AMR to resolve these channelized regions. It's actually really neat. Um, it's fairly recent. We're still trying to couple this to bicycles, so it's um, it's a new thing, but it's one of the things we're doing. Um, you want to couple this to ocean, you want to couple bicycles to ocean or ice sheets 
or sorry, ice sheet models to Earth system models. Bicycles have been coupled to the UK's Earth system model. Um, it, it produced the first fully coupled Antarctic response where you actually have the ice fully interacting with the climate system. It's, it turns out that's very hard. Um, coupling is very hard because you basically put in the model and then step back and hit it with a hammer and hope everything works out. It's, it, it wasn't being very hard. So I just want to mention that we, we were doing that. Um, the way it works is basically you have this, you have these different models which are held together by a coupler and just add the ice sheet model is one other thing that it talks to the different, you know, the atmosphere model, the land model, the ocean model through this coupler. Um, that's the way all major climate models are built. So it's it's a very complicated dance of software and, and software engineering to make, and mathematics to make these things work. Um, another thing we can do with ice sheet, with ice sheet model, now we have this AMR one, is we can look at what, what are the resolution requirements for actually doing this? What, what, so we have, we were able to resolve this, uh, these things that like, you know, kilometer or sub-kilometer re resolution, what is it, what is, what is the impact of that? And so um, we did a set of Antarctic simulations with full, full continent Antarctica. And um, basically what we would do is we would vary the amount of resolution. So so with eight kilometer resolution base, base mesh where every, each one of those cells is eight kilometers wide and then adapt to re and then just add more resolution, more resolution and run a series of cut cases down to a 500 meter resolution. Um, and then at the initial time, we basically set, basically hit these ice shells with a hammer. We do this outlandish, massive, it's not, it's not really scale, it's really extreme melting, but the idea is to hit the Antarctic with a hammer and make it respond. Um, and then we evolved this for a thousand years for each, each of these cases. And here's what happens in sort of one of the cases, um, the most resolved case. The point is that it was, you can see what happens. We basically kill, clobber the ice shells very quickly, and then you have this massive retreat, basically driven by the fact that we've lost all this buttressing. And it, when you can see, it's, sorry, it's, it's very continuous here, but it's not because it's going through Zoom, it's a little jerky. But you can see that it's very easy to make all of Western Antarctica deglaciate. And that's about four meters of sea level rise. Um, basically, which is by melting the ice shells. And just to show what's happening with the adaptive mesh refinement, this shows the resolution. Um, black is the finest resolution. And you can see that the resolution, the places we have resolution changes in, in, as the ice sheet evolves. Right? So that's the whole point of AMR is that we're able to, oh boy, it's really, it's really pretty here. Um, it's really smooth and slick. But the point is that we're able to deploy the finest resolution just where we need it at the grounding line. Um, and so if you look, if you plot up the, the contribution of sea level rise over time for each of these cases, um, I'm gonna step away from the thing for a minute. This black line is eight kilometer resolution. So it doesn't do much. And this is uh, four kilometer resolution, two kilometer resolution, one kilometer resolution, 500 meters. So you can see that basically you need this probably, I wouldn't trust anything that wasn't this line or better, right? And you can see that this, these lines behave very differently. This one, these guys are actually converging, converging to something, right? So I would imagine that if there was a 250 meter resolution, and I did do that at some point, it's going to be very close to the yellow line, right? So we're converging to something that's probably about here. Um, so that's, that demonstrates the fact that you need good resolution to get the right answer, right? I wouldn't, like I said, I wouldn't trust these guys. And one of the things that before we did this, before we joined the field, a lot of people were doing right computations, which are basically in this region, right? You can't really afford to do the high resolution unless you have something like AMR or a really big machine or both. Um, this low plot is the rate of change of, of ice, of, of, of uh, sea level rise. Um, and you can see that um, for the course, there's, there's a spike that happens and it happens at different times. And this, this spike is basically the collapse of Western Antarctica. And the point here is that you can see that for fire regional resolution, it happens like about 250 years. And then, it, you know, different resolutions, it gets coarser and then never, you know, the course really coarse it never happens at all. So um, this means that the timing is also a function of resolution. And we, I would, if I was going to make my bets on when to buy, you know, when to buy electrified uh, house, I would want to use that one as, as my prediction. And the reason why is looking down. This, this is looking down on the Western Arctic. This is the Amundsen Sea. West, uh, I mean, this is over here somewhere. The green line is the ground line. This is Hanai Glacier. This is Quates, which you may have heard about. This is this is another completely different. Um, System. This is the uh, Pilsen Arani ice shell. And this is, like I said, this is the Amazon Sea. 
uh, this red is the ice velocity. Um, so red is fast moving ice, blue is slow moving ice. I'm just going to show you what happens as we evolve this thing. Um, it, it's pretty dramatic. And you can see, I don't know if you saw what happened there, but basically, what happened there is that um, weights collapse, right? So this, the, the most issue happens with weights. Everything kind of drained out with weights into the Amundsen Sea. <laughs> I'll watch it some more time because it's very fast, but right. So it's weights collapsed, and then basically, and you also met with something. This is the the Ross ice shelf here, and but it's somebody it just it's made up and clobber everything. But if we're under resolved, if we have two clobber resolution instead of one clobber resolution, something different happens. Thwaites stalls. You see that this is not retreating because it's under resolved, and so the mechanism is different. You wind up draining, draining everything out this way. And it just it, so you get the if you're unresolved, you get the timing wrong, you get the amounts wrong, you get the, the mechanism wrong, you get everything wrong. So this is a demonstration that getting being able to resolve these things with adaptive fish environment and sufficient resolution is actually super important, right? Otherwise, you get the wrong answer and you're wasting your time. And this is actually a big argument with the community. It was like, look, people say, well, I can't afford to do that. Was like, well, you, but don't don't even try it because you're not, you're wasting your time. Right? You're producing bad science. Um. So the result was that we get a complete collapse of Western Arctic if we're sufficiently resolved with this test case. Um, but if you're unresolved, you get lower ground line mutability, lower sea level rise contribution, contributions, and just you delay everything and you just under, underestimate the response. And it's also qualitatively different. They're, they behave, they're different mechanisms, et cetera. So um, the other thing is to point out is that the amount of sea level rise in these simulations is about four meters of sea level rise, which is about what? 12, 15 feet. So that's kind of what we're talking about ballpark wise in terms of response. Um, I can skip that. Um, but then the next question is, so you saw what happened there, right? And you saw that clobbering ice shelves can cause a major response. So then we said, well, let's look at how vulnerable Antarctica is. So we'll, strict it, we'll look at divide Antarctica regions and we'll, hit, we'll clobber each of these regions individually, right? So you say, well, if I get warm water here, what happens? If I get warm water here, is where is the vulnerability in, the, in, in Antarctica? Um, so we did this. We basically it was fourteen different sectors. So we ran each, you know, each of them after a thousand years. Um, this is a paper that came out in twenty nineteen. We even got the cover of the paper of the journal, which is nice. Um, and what we what we found was that basically, so this, the size of the circle is the amount of vulnerability, right? So after a thousand meters, after a thousand years, hitting this sector is a tenth of a meter sea level rise. But hitting these, you know, was like 2.3 meters of sea level rise, 2.6. So, and it turns out you'll notice something about these, each of these, each of these big sectors is they're all connected to this sort of underbelly region here, this, this very vulnerable region here in some way. And so the, the, the conclusion there was that out here is not that vulnerable. What we care about is here. That's not our case. It's where the vulnerability to sea level rise is. Um, and I'm going to show you one example of even just a little bit, right? So if I clobber just this sector, sector 14, right, there's just a little bit of a, of a touch into there just because of the way I draw the lines. But even that is enough to do some major damage. So this is the same sort of thing where you can see that. It just even clobbering that little bit basically results in, you know, basically just basically clobbering all of West Africa. Just getting any, so getting anything that can touch that vulnerable sector, it's so vulnerable that it'll it'll just clobber everything. Um, because yeah, then it, it sort of just. It just sort of finds if it finds a way to it, it's not linear, but it is pretty dramatic. So by the end, just getting a little bit of warm water here results in all this. So that's you know that's how vulnerable it all is. Um, next thing we do is we can actually talk about adding new physics. So these models have all been based on sort of undamaged ice, right? So ice basically imagine ice cube; it's very pretty. It's there's there's it's it's, it's very clear. Um, but real ice is, is damaged. It's got fractures, crevasses, and et cetera. I mean, how does the ice feel today? So look at this. This is a series of satellite movies. You can see that the ice 
is it's not smooth, right? So you see all these. Um, this is the, this is zooming into here. This is breaking off. You see this these regions of there's obviously a lot going on here. You've got um, lots of crevasses, lots of broken ice, right? So it's not this nice fluid that we've been modeling. Um, so what do we do? Um, it turns out that we can even see that it isn't bad because when we actually try to match observed velocities with our ice sheet model, we have to adopt some sort of viscosity model. We have to basically change the viscosity of the ice to match the model, to match the observations. And what we normally see this is an example of, of such just such an inversion. Um, this we, we call this solving an inverse problem. We um, try to infer the properties of the ice based on the observations because we can't actually measure these things. Um, so this is this is the Pine Island Glacier. This is weights. This is the Amundsen Sea. Same thing as before. Um, regions where it's red are regions where we have to reduce the ice viscosity to match the observations, right? Because we see these sort of trunk of, of ice flying through and then and these sort of damage regions. And these damage regions tend to line up with places where we see lots of, um, or it's a place where we have to change the viscosity, match them very well with places where we've had to, um, where we, we've seen damage. So it seems like there's, there's a good correlation there. Um, I'll point out, you see a lot of blue here, directly in the in sort of the center of the ice shelf. I think that's because our, our temperature field is cold. Right, so this is a place where the where the observations are telling us our ice is not stiff enough. That's probably because it's our ice and our model is too warm. And so we're expect we're that's just that's sort of a nice reality check that um this is what we have to do to match the match physics. Um, and you can say that's great. We can we can do this inversion. That's fine. We can just have this carry this thing around. We're good. But this is this is a, this is a snapshot, right? So what happens when the uh, randomizer heat the ice evolves? We can't, we have no way of evolving those regions. Like we can tell where they are right now. We have no way of knowing what happens in the future. Or if you're doing, people do paleo simulations where they try to understand the ice sheets for, you know, 10,000 years ago. Well, I don't have any satellite pictures from 10,000 years ago to do that with. So, um, so can we damage that? And so can we model that? And so we're following, following some people in 2015. They, they start with the damage of a single crevasse, right? A single cut in the ice. Um, and yeah, so for, we can think about this in a thought experience. Tr the crosses are transport of the ice flow, right? So as ice flows downstream, the crevasse goes with it. If ice is in tension, the crevasses tend to, tend to increase, right? Because if ice is pulling apart, it's going to tend to make the crevasse deeper. If ice is in compression, the crevasse is going to tend to heal, right? If you push the ice together, it's going to eventually heal. And so we evolved this quantity note, which we're, which we're going to call damage. And it's a measure of the of average crevasse penetration. So D equals zero means no crevassing. It's Perfectly undamaged ice. D equals one means that the, the um, crevasse is fully penetrated. There's no mechanical um, continuity there, right? It, there, basically, the ice is, is completely damaged. And that leads to basically calving. Um, and the goal is then can we couple this with our model and then evolve that? And so the first experiment we did, um, basically modeling this thing, this, this, this ice tongue. Ice tongues are regions where the ice is basically sticking out of the ocean. The ice is basically pushing out, and for some reason, you have these very stable, long tongues of ice. Um, and if we use our damage model in this, we can actually predict with the damage rate zero, we can predict where this calving front happens. And it turns out that you know our predictions actually line up very good with the observations. Um, this is the one dimension problem, this sort of a reality check, and it was, it was nice to check, and we published that back in 2022. The point is that we are able to predict. Where the where the ice tongue breaks off by using our damage model, right? So that's kind of a neat thing. And for a two D ice tongue, you can you can sort of generate these these um, predictive cavern, which is which actually matches the theory very well. Um, and if we actually do this damage to see, we can evolve the steady state, and we wind up with shear margin. We have areas of high damage which look very similar to river those red regions before. So we're we're doing something right. We can predict the areas of high damage. And the next question is, um, what about coupling it? So this was actually a summer project we did with some people, uh, Duncan Carpenter and Professor Anjali Sundi from the University of North Dakota last summer. So um, this is actually you guys a year ago. Um, and we actually wound up presenting this at uh, the AGU fall meeting in San Francisco in 20, last December. Um, so we need a coupling function. We need to figure out how do we turn our damage number to our viscosity multiplier? Um, people just generally assume it's a linear thing, right? You say, well, the obvious thing is at one minus D, right? So if damage is zero, uh, the, the multiplier is one. If damage is 
if it's fully damaged, then multiply it at zero. Well, we experiment with different, different forms. Um, and like, for example, linear hyperbolic tangent are a couple that we try with. And what our collaborator did, what Sam did, was he took, he took our multiply the, basically took everywhere he completely commuted damage and correlated with the, with the viscosity multiplier we got from our inversion. I mean, this is our version. And then by basically using, you try to figure out what kind of best fit would create a map here that looked like that. Right? So you get the, we're not going to worry too much about the blue regions because we know that's a temperature problem. But we want to try to map our viscosity changes to what we see in reality. So we wind up with something that's sort of a hyperbolic tangent. And then we try this, the same sort of, the same flow in a trough test case that we tried before. Um, and we, we, just to see if there's an impact on damage on actually using this damage. And it turns out that you look at both the grounded area and the um, contribution sea level rise. The, the only thing, the, the point that the know is the solid lines are without the damage coupling and the dotted lines are with. So in every case, it has a big, it has a noticeable impact. In every case, coupling with damage makes the contribution sea level rise big. There are, there are never any good news. I mean, everything is always, everything is always, oh, this is actually worse than we thought. But the other thing that was interesting was looking at this, so, and then the top is the evolution of, of the damage over time. This is, un, this is not without the coupling, this and the bottom is with the coupling. And you get these really weird thing, and you get these really weird soft tooth patterns in the ice shell. And we saw that, and I was like, this is, this is actually really spectacular because this, this looks like something in nature. And so it looks like, this is, this is another ice tongue in, in Arctica called the Airbus ice tongue. You see you have these slime sawtooth things. If you look at this, the, the, this is actually a, um, a movie of the uh, actual experiment. Um, this is a retreat phase, and now it's regrowing again. And you can see that it's growing back. But it's growing back as an ice tongue, right? You can see these, 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 these regions in the side. So it's, it's not growing back as, as the ice shelf that it started off as. And you start seeing these cuts in the ice. Um, and then you start to see this recurrent pattern, which is that sawtooth pattern we see there. And as far as I know, no one's ever managed to reproduce this in the model before. So it was like, wow. And it's really, what's happening is that the, the damage here, you have this concentration here, area here where the damage is causing the viscosity to go down. And it's causing this local dynamic change, right? So it's, it's causing the grab and release, grab and release, grab and release. Um, that's our latest result, and it, it's probably one of the coolest things we've done. Um, I think that's all I have time for. So, thanks. This is work with a lot of people. So, um, uh, basically, you know, people in the UK, people in DOE, people here at Berkeley Lab, University of Michigan. Um, it's been it's been it's, it's been a fun. Right. Any questions? Thoughts, comments? Yes? Oh, what are you using to compare your model to like confirm that it's actually working correctly? Like I guess so, like the picture you just showed was awesome. Um, for example, when you were talking about lowering the resolution to seeing like, let's say the and has the resolution gets to like zero. What's to say that there's not going to be another qualitative change as you get down to a lower, much lower scale? Like that. Um, our hope is that, I mean, the way, the way numerical models generally work is that you get into something known as the asymptotic regime, where you're sufficiently resolved with the model behaves according to some mathematical properties, right? And this is what, this, that's what we were seeing in that case. Suddenly, we're seeing the model behave in a mathematically predictable way. It, the, the error was, was basically reducing by a factor of two every time we resolve the mesh, right? Which is first order convergence. And so the idea is that once you're sufficiently resolved, you expect, there's, there, there are no, in the model itself, there are no gotchas, right? Because we understand the physics, it's, it's continuous equation. Are there other bits of physics that are gonna make things weird? That's not that's not really part of that discussion right there. And is it like, uh, it's, I'm looking at you're seeing like hundreds of years. So like, is there any data that you can use from the real world to like match them up or is it just unknown for now? Um, we have a, 20 years or so of, of good observations now, right? 20 to 50, 20 to 40 years, depending on where you look. Um, people are starting to get where you can actually try to reproduce that. But yeah, it, it's the hardest thing because by the time 
we validate our models, it's too late, right? I mean, so you have to sort of have some faith that we're doing it right. And I think in the past, since we've been doing this, the, the, the level of sophistication in the community is, has, has grown by these bounds. People are taking this very seriously and people are really deploying everything they can to make sure that they get a good answer, right? So, but that, yeah, there, there is a certain amount of, we can't, we only have one earth and we can't speed it up. Yeah. Okay, so when you couple multiple module, I guess, like you have earth, you have land, you have wind, maybe into a model, uh, I can see that you apply, a little, you need to deal with the problem of cloud information and basically initialize, initial condition. And the model that uh, you publish is different time frame or different models. So some like for the Earth model is like 2011, for the Antarctica map is 2010, for example. Is that going to be a limitation? Is that going to cause anything that is less accurate? There, are, I think there are a couple of questions tied up in that one question. Um, <laughs> there is a big problem, yes, in glaciology, particularly where you have thickness observations from 2018 and velocity observations from 2020, and they don't. And there is a mismatch there, and so you try to deal with that as best you can. Um, observations have gotten better; the way they can actually do this. Oh, um, yeah. What has happened over the past twenty years is the amount of observations that are being made at a place like Antarctic Greenland have gone up, you know, through the roof. And so we have much better and much more consistent observations than we did before. Yes, yeah, some guy flew over in in twenty twenty, and then some guy ten years later went and measured velocities, and you just you're like, this doesn't match up at all. Um, and you do the best you can, but it is getting better. Um, I think that's the question you were asking, right? Okay. All right. Um, so I have a question for when it comes to observe some of the uh, parameters, uh, parameters such as like bat levels and ice thickness. Like, how do you uh, do the do the measurement for that? Well, I don't do it, but um, there are different techniques, right? So there are everything from satellites. There are now dedicated satellites to, to which use radar and um, and different architects of itinerary to measure the like the surface of the ice. And there's ground protein radio, which actually measure where the bedrock is. Um, the, one of my collaborators actually spent three months in Pine Island, uh, in Antarctica, basically dragging a radar array over the ice, right? Mm -hmm. Getting a really, really high resolution picture, look at what was under it. He said it was, you know, fairly boring and fairly fun at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, expanse of white, <laughs> and you're just driving back and forth in straight lines, you know, <laughs> drive for um, two miles and turn around, drive back two miles on a less snowmobile we'll plane to red. Um, there's also, I mean, there's there's a whole, and there's also radar over, overflights. Um, when it comes to oceans, one of the cool things they have, they actually instrument a bunch of seals. And so the, the seals basically do places where no submarine can go. And so they're, they have this really weird random map of where the seals have gone with, they have these big, they put, put them on their backs. And they have like, you know, temperature, salinity, you know, depth. And it's, it's really cool. Um, so we're, we're hiring the seals to do our work for us. <laughs> so, I mean, it, people are being very creative in how you how you get this data because sometimes it's really hard. Yeah. So, mostly satellites. Thank you. Any other questions? Carmen. Yeah. Uh, there, there are great satellites that use radar winds, as you mentioned, but you also mentioned during the presentation uh, sensors that attach to the sheets themselves. What kind of sensors are those? Um. So in Greenland, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll take a GPS sensor and just station it on the ice and, and measure the ex acceleration like over like a melt season, right? So they're very localized, very much point sensors. But the idea is to sort of try and understand the dynamics of, you know, they have, they have this mechanism where meltwater forms to the surface and then you basically bring these big lakes and these lakes drain overnight and then cause the ice to basically put all the way at the bottom of the bed and then cause it to accelerate. So you can actually measure these accelerations, these accelerations. But it's very localized, and you, if you have two sensors like you know a mile apart, they'll get very different readings. And so it's very, very localized and very, very in time and space. And so that's what um, that's what they they're doing that along with the sort of big satellite ones. They're also doing these very localized point measurements. Um, used to be they would also they would um, hammer stakes into the ice and then sort of measure where the stakes were over time, right? And so you can see this as 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 something sort of went downstream, you can see that the you know some stakes were going faster than the others. But that was over, you know, the course of many, many seasons. 
So final reminder, crash course in supercomputing on Friday. Interested, please. It's a form that you need to use.